Honourable Members will resume from where we left off, and I give the floor to the Honourable. Thank you, uh, Honourable yes. Speaker. The introductory remarks by the Honourable Minister for Employment, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, reflects this deep-seated fear of the government of the opposition, you know? Uh, this deep-seated fear of criticism. This deep-seated fear of actually losing power. That's why they keep blaming the opposition for politicizing the issue. In fact, Mr. Speaker, in fact, Mr. Speaker, on top of that, they never stop praising themselves, even in this crisis, you know? That's, that's the kind of uh, introductory remark that the minister made. But let me, let me just get onto, onto the, um, Onto the survey. I think, Mr. Speaker, only time will tell uh, whether this survey uh, will help in the protection of workers' rights and the interest of employers. Because what, what we have had, Mr. Speaker, we've had many reports uh, to our office that show that actually there is chaos and confusion in the Ministry of Employment, and the Honorable Minister should look at that. And let me give, give some examples, Mr. Speaker, in the way they are trying to enforce the employment laws. Uh, they, I know of a public transport company which uh, was paying about $4 an hour to its drivers. Because of the crisis, they reduced it to $3.46. We are told that it's a minimum stipulated rate for drivers. But then the Ministry of Employment officials were saying, no, no, you can't reduce the rate. And the employer said, well, I can't just leave the buses on the way. I can't reduce the hours. The buses have to run for the full uh, five, six, or seven days. That's just one example. Another example, Mr. Speaker, that I want the minister to take into account, there's a garment factory company which has reduced both the hours of work and also the rate at which they are paying. So these are the issues that the Honorable Minister uh, should, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, concentrate and look at how his officials are dealing with these issues. On this issue, Mr. Speaker, I also want to suggest, I mean, as I said the other day, you know, we are in, a, in the middle of this huge uh, crisis and the impact on our economy, as I said, Mr. Speaker, uh, the contraction of the economy this year could be between the range of 15 to 20 percent, and that would be a huge contraction. That would mean that thousands of workers would be without jobs in this country, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we need to have some very clear plan, and this is why I also suggested that we should create a worker solidarity fund. The government reduced the, the FNPF contribution from 18 to 10 percent, 5 percent for the employer's contribution, and the 3 percent, of course, the employee's contribution, which goes to the employees. But out of that 5 percent contribution, if you look at the total salaries and wages of about $1 billion uh, in the revised budget, and if we work that out, on average, the government is going to save about $4 million uh, per month. And what we are suggesting, Mr. Speaker, is government should put that money into a workers' solidarity fund because I think the situation is going to get worse. There are many, many people, and in fact, I said the other day that while we have about 28 to 30 percent of the, the households below the poverty line, we could see, Mr. Speaker, in the next six months, you know, given the crisis that we have, that the poverty rate could reach about 50 percent, those 20 percent on the margins of the poverty line could fall well below the poverty line. And that is why and many of these would be workers who would be losing jobs, who would be on reduced hours, reduced days, and, and this is where I think the, the Workers Solidarity Fund, Mr. Speaker, would be, would be very, very important. And I also think that some of the direct budget support that we are getting from the donors, for example, from the Australians, from the New Zealand, we should look at how we can use some of those funds. Because in a crisis, Mr. Speaker, it is very important for the government and for us in Parliament to ensure that the most vulnerable and those who are expected to fall into that vulnerable group are helped. And that is the kind of things we should be talking about here. Not coming out here and, and blaming the opposition for raising legitimate criticism and forgetting about all the suggestions that we have given. This is politicizing the issue. You know, and then, and then uh, Mr. Speaker, they keep on praising themselves that they're doing everything right. They're not doing everything right, Mr. Speaker. That is the point I want to make. So, so I, I need to remind the government and especially the ministers, you know, please don't come here and say the opposition is politicizing the issue. The opposition is raising legitimate issues, legitimate concerns that the people, 
Mr. Speaker, the people come to our office on a daily basis. I know they go to the ministers as well. So what we are doing is reflecting the people's views in this parliament on the issues. And that's what we're trying to do. And we're also, in doing so, making suggestions as well, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think, thank the Honourable Bimin Prasad for his response. And I now give the floor to the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Community Development, the Honourable Pramila Kumar, to deliver her statement.